Good morning, church. <clears throat> so I'd like to have us think about an experience which you probably all have had. It's pretty common, and I'd like to see how that relates uh, to a spiritual experience, which I wonder if we've had, and I'd like us to think about, and Jesus has something to say about. So the experience is this. You buy a new car. It might be a used car, new to you, but you get this new vehicle, and all of a sudden, strangest thing, those kind of cars are everywhere. They're everywhere. Where were all these cars before? You just got this car this morning, and now the road's flooded with them. So the coincidental truth must be that everyone bought that car on the same day as you, which is so weird that that would happen. Or perhaps they've been there all along, but we just didn't have eyes to see them. Right? Never noticed them before. How many things do you think we don't notice? All right. Why is it that we start noticing those cars when we buy ours? Does anyone have even a stab in the dark? I always kind of wondered about this, and then I was reading the scripture for today. I was like, this actually is the perfect illustration for this sort of thing. Why is that? Anybody have an idea? We want to be validated in our choice. Hmm. Okay. So it's affirming. You find, yo, you're like me, you're like me, and it's... For me, that's a really wise beyond your years, young Devin. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Pearl? Mm. You're focused on it. Yeah, yeah, great points. Tracy? Awareness. awareness. You've become aware. Yeah, good. Felicia? Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we see God working in those moments, right? Where um, I know this was how it was for me, um, thinking about the ministry and whether God was calling to me to become a pastor all those years back. And I, I wasn't sure. But then I had these things that I kept seeing the same sorts of things. So I said, well, is this something that God's trying to show me? He's making me aware of these things? Uh, why are all these people coming in and having these specific conversations with me now when they weren't before? So um, is it sort of us becoming aware? Is it God doing something? Is it a combination? I think it could be many things. Um, but why do you think we notice certain things and not others? Why do you think there are things, let's say the laundry on the floor next to the bed, why do you think that there are some things that we will never notice, and yet they're right there? We actually have to step over them to get out of the room, and yet somehow not noticed. Isn't this funny? These are things that we see all the time, but sometimes our eyes are open to it, and sometimes they're not. So whether it's our values, things we think are important, things that are a part of us, who knows? I think these are all great suggestions, but at the very least, we have to recognize we don't always see what there is to see. We're not actually seeing the full picture probably at any time. And if you put two people next to each other, different eyesight, different things standing out to us, they're going to see different things. Look at the same room. One person sees the wall color, the other person sees the dirty laundry. You know? When I walk into a room, it's apparent to me um, sort of how people are doing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply passionate about relationships. And so if I see someone who looks down, my heart will kind of go out to them. If I see someone cheerful, it'll boost me. So I'm somehow perceiving how others are feeling. And not all the time, but that's something I notice. It's something I then pray about, something to think about. Sometimes I'll come to you and say, how are you doing? And it's because somehow it felt like maybe there's laundry on the floor. <laughs> and maybe I could help, we could pray about it and pick it up and get rid of it. But whatever it may be, we notice different things. Some people notice what others are wearing. This may be true of some of us. You walk into a room or people come in, you just notice. Did you see those shoes that person was wearing? Did you see the, the, all the rips in the back of the pants? Who was I was working with Ray the other day? A big rip right through the butt of his pants. And he's walking around, and I didn't see it. He could have been walking around me for three days, and I never would have noticed. He's like, my pants have a big rip in them. Were you not going to say anything? He, I didn't notice. He didn't notice. Eventually, he noticed. Probably changed his pants since then. You can check after church. I don't know. But we don't always see things, but we want to, especially when it comes to the important things. What if you're a spouse and your spouse is really hurting? You probably would want to know that, right? But what if you don't see it? What if you have a child that's thinking even suicidal, if not just depressed thoughts, but kind of puts on a smile so you don't sense it? They're not saying anything. You can't see it. God knows those things, right? 
God knows that child's heart, that spouse's heart, our heart, even if it's not visible and no one picks up on it. So if we're in tune with Christ, in tune with God, he can give us eyes to see those things. Well, how about the things in us that we need to change? Right? If we never see it, we're not going to admit it. And as the... Um, the 12-step programs remind us, you know, admitting we have a problem is the first step to doing anything with it. That's how it is with sin and salvation. That's how it is with our vocabulary. That's how it is with the, the language we use when we speak to others, the way we treat people. We just might not see it. We have our opinions. We see things a certain way. We see the world the way we see it. And um, maybe it's not the right way. You put on sunglasses and everything looks different. <laughs> it's your glasses. It's not reality. How we see things is vastly important to what we're going to do with our own lives, vastly important for how we deal with other people, and really says a lot about our faith. Because if we don't notice any of the sins in our lives as being a problem, we don't see any issues or needs in the people around us and never reaching out, we don't look out on the world and have our heart broken at all, well then, where is our faith? God should be opening our eyes to that. If we're not looking inward or outward or anywhere, these are things that the Holy Spirit sees and should be, is, trying to tell us. So then the prayer becomes, okay, God, open my eyes. That's why we sang the songs we did this morning. That's the topic for the conversation this morning. And um, that's where I'd like us to go. So let's say a word of prayer, and then we'll open to the Gospel of Luke together. Father God, please open our eyes. Even as we read these scriptures, I pray that they wouldn't just be words on the page, but that we would notice things in the scripture, that things would stand out. I pray that you'd help us not to be blind to those around us and not to turn a blind eye to our own sin, but to just ask you to work and do what you do. So please speak to us through your word. Give me the right words to say to communicate what it is that you want to communicate. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak these truths into our lives, each of us individually, that this wouldn't just be some mass message for lots of people, but that it would be an individual thing where we hear you speaking to us. This is what I ask for, and I pray for, for each of us here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you would turn to Luke chapter 11, we're going to look at, read together a couple of scriptures, but I'd like to read to you a couple first, as we're doing so. The metaphor that the Bible uses for this kind of seeing or not seeing is light and dark. So if you can't see something, the Bible would say you're in darkness. If you can, there's been light that's been shed. Uh, first John, or John 1 says, you know, the light came into the world. This light was the life and the light of the world. But the world has not understood him, even though he made them, because they love their darkness. It's where you're comfortable. It's the things that you don't want to change. It's the, yeah, it's the things that are not right or not true but which are in us and around us. God's truth is what he uses. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. He says, my word is the truth, the Holy Spirit of truth. Truth is what comes, reveals the way things really are, and then defines. It's like that's the light, right? You turn on the flashlight in the room, and it's defining where everything is. So if I were to read these scriptures for you to kind of paint this picture, John 3, 19 through 21 says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Are any of us afraid that we might get caught? Afraid that our deeds were not this perfect church person that actually doesn't exist, but which we think does? Um, Verse 21, whoever lives by the truth. So we've got truth and light, synonymous. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so it may be seen plainly what he, what he has done has been done through God. So the truth is that we're just needy creatures. There is a creator, and what has been done, this truth does not originate from us. We are not capable of defining truth on our own. You can't have this truth is your truth, this truth is my truth, then it's not truth, then it's choice. This choice is yours. Truth has got to be a thing, otherwise it doesn't exist. There can't be two truths. So truth is truth. There is a sun, there is gravity, things like this. Um, so truth is the light. And that's why when we encounter Christ the first time, he says the truth about us. The truth is you're trying to be a good person, but you know that's not good enough because you're still not good. And your efforts to be good are not working. And that's frustrating for you. 
The truth is that I can take care of that for you. Hence Christ. Hence grace. The truth that comes into the world is Jesus, saying, love God, put yourself last, be sacrificial instead of self-centered. And the world has a hard time with this. We have a hard time with this. But we believe it, and we commit to it, and we submit to it, and then it changes us. It's the truth. We live by the truth. So here's the light. Here's the truth. What about those who are outside of that? Someone who doesn't have God providing light. It doesn't have a single source of truth. doesn't have this. Well, 1 Corinthians 2 would say, um, We speak not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. The man without the Spirit does not accept things that come from God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So the things that the truth brings are foolishness to those who don't want to hear, who don't want to know. It doesn't make any sense. It's not like, oh yeah, I, I probably should be doing that. That doesn't even make any sense. Because... We're in the darkness. I want to stay in the darkness. And that commitment to stay in the darkness and to avoid the light will mean that we're never seeing things clearly. And although it might have this nagging sensation deep in us that maybe there's something to that light thing, it's way more comfortable to stay in the darkness. So here's a question in the third scripture before we read what Jesus has to say. How do people that live in the darkness, as we would define it, find their light? What gives them meaning? What gives them direction? Because I think it would be a pretty frustrating life to feel like, well, I know there's truth over there, I know I'm not living in it, and I want to be blind. No, instead we supplant it, we replace it with a different kind of light, a man-made light, our own light, the things that we value. We, we, we get a car, we love it, we see it. So if we don't have God providing any light, well, then what do I think is right? Then that is right. And now I, with those lenses, if we could use that metaphor, will look at the world and decide measure everybody else against what I feel is right or not. That's not true light. We're not capable of defining truth in that way. So, in essence, we just become the judge. <laughs> Figure out what works for me, which is fine, but then we measure everybody else to us. That's wrong. It's sinful. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And there's an amazing scripture that talks about this. It's in Proverbs 21.4. It says, Haughty eyes... So kind of like uplifted, prideful, self-promoting, um, um, I guess. Haughty eyes and a proud heart. Now, I know I'm right. This is what I want. I have the right to stand firmly on this because this is mine. A bold heart is another way you could translate the word. A bold heart. This is me. Haughty eyes, thinking we're right. A proud heart, standing firm in who what we are. These are sin. And you know what Proverbs 21.4 calls them? The lamp of the wicked. These things are a lamp. It's like a dark lamp. <laughs> but they are the illuminating factor for so many people. So many people are driven by doing better in their job and working their way up to getting the better office and the better, that's their lamp. The way they see the world, the thing that's inside of them, is illuminating everything. When they look at their job, they don't see a place to work as unto God, when you're working for men, they don't see the workplace as a place to serve. They don't see a workplace as a place to use our gifts and support our family. They look at the workplace as a challenge. They look at the workplace as something that we've got to win. They look at the workplace as something that uh, if I can get higher up, I am better off. And when I'm above him and when I get this paycheck, then I will have arrived. It illuminates everything they see. But it's like a different color light bulb or something. It's just shining everything in a different light. You're in the same place, but you are not seeing things the same way. The wicked, if you can say it that way, because someone totally in darkness is someone not accepting the truth. So the Bible says the wicked are the foolish. These people apart from God, actually in that translation, I think wicked could also be translated godless. <clears throat> so the godless, people without God, they've got a different lamp. So when they walk through the world, they see different things. They're driving different cars and spotting different cars. They don't see the laundry, or they do. They just see it entirely differently. It's a worldview. It's a concept. Their whole eyesight is different because what's inside of them is illuminating what they see outside. It's like I can't get through the eyes without being filtered by who they are inside. And that's where it comes, the internal and the external sort of thing. So looking now at Luke 33, Jesus builds on this. Um, Luke 11... 
Please turn with me. There are Bibles under your seats if you need one. <coughs> so Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke 11, 33. So what does Jesus say about this? Luke eleven thirty three, Jesus says, No one lights a lamp and puts it in its place, puts it in a place where it will be hidden. It's not the point of a lamp. What's the point of a lamp? To cast light. It's the point of it, the whole point of it. No one puts it under a bowl. No one hides it. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. So Jesus is the light. We're called to be the light of the world. Those sorts of things. Light is not meant to be hidden. Light is meant to be broadcast. Verse 34. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. A word on this before we move on. This verse has always stumped me like crazy. Because an eye, to me, seems like something that's more like a window, where the light gets in. And so the more I read about this, the more I realized that back in Jesus' time, and before him, and a little bit after, there was kind of this transition about how people thought that you could even see. We're so intermingled with great modern uh, science and understanding of anatomy and biology and how things work. None of those things, only some of them were known at that time. So there was a theory of vision that our bodies, from our spirit, cast a light from our eyes to illuminate the things that we saw. Didn't recognize that the sun could, you know, send a light and reflect and balance and colors. And it was just a different way of looking at it. Think about that. If our eyes are the lamp, they're sending out the light that's within us. I think this scripture is uh, talking about that same sort of concept. So as modern science has kind of developed they would say that this is not physically accurate. Well, that's good, because we're not talking about physical eyes here. <laughs> the spiritual truth that's being taught here, I think, is exactly still the same. The things that we see really come from what we want to see, or what we can see, or what we're capable of seeing. So they come from within us. The, the cars that we notice, that doesn't, it's not about the cars, and it's not about the light of the sun shining on the cars. What do we have eyes to see? There is something about our eyes only being able to see that which comes from within us, and the eyes casting light to be able to open the eyes of my heart so that I may see you. God's here. So not open the eyes of my heart so that you can arrive. So there's something about our eyes opening, and maybe some of you have different translations talking about if your eyes are healthy. Uh, another way this word could be used is your eyes are sound, which means you have good eyes. Another word is generous. Your eyes can be generous. Because the people at this time also believed that sort of the, the wider your eyes were open, the more generous, the more light allowed in, the more you'd be able to see, so the more of your light could interact with the world. So it's really a, a statement of how much your spirit can reach out and see the world around you and how much it can process to you. And what, what is an eye as a lamp? Is it illuminating inside? I think what it's saying here, eye is your lamp for your body. It sees where you're going to go. It broadcasts this light, which is based on who we are inside. So it's just kind of a unique way to look at eyesight. It's not maybe the main point of what we need to get, but it's something to think about. What's in us is going to determine what we see. If you don't have Christ in you, you can't see certain things. If you do have Christ in you, you should be able to see certain things. In Christ, we pray to be able to see certain things because he's in us. And so somehow he's working from the inside out to reveal these things which are outside of us. The eyes being the lamp of the body, casting the light that we have to see. It's just a, a really interesting thought, I felt, in studying this verse. So think about it then as we develop it. No one lights a lamp. We're lit like the lamp. The fire is inside the lamp and comes out. Christ is in us and the light comes forth from us. The lamp gets put on its stand so that it can give forth light, so the light's not meant to be internal. Our eyes are supposed to be wide open so that that light pours through. So to see where this can go if we think along these lines. So your eye is the lamp for your body. When your eyes are healthy or sound or generous, your whole body is also full of light. Not because it's being filled, but because you're full of light and you're showing it through your eyes. Eyes being the window to the soul, that kind of a concept. But when your eyes are unhealthy, the other word for this is unsound or stingy. <laughs> when you have stingy eyes, it's like your eyes are narrowed. The tunnel vision, you can only see this little bit. You're not letting out what you have. You're not able to receive back in. It's like constricting 
the channel to be able to see what's going on. When your eyes are unhealthy, your body is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. The lamp of the wicked, the light that's paving their way, proud eyes, a proud heart, haughty eyes. That's what's coming out. Isn't this what Jesus said about things that you eat too? <laughs> it's not what you put into your mouth that makes you guilty of sin or impure. It's the things in your heart, things like greed. Greed comes out. It comes out of your eyes, absolutely. Isn't that a perfect example of one? The things we see that we want. Right? So if the light, your body is also full of darkness if your eyes are unhealthy. See to it then that the light within you, what you're using to light your way, if it's your ambition at work, if it's this or if it's that, see to it that that light is not actually darkness. Because what if you're looking at the whole world through dark glasses? What if you have a lens on that's not from God? See to it that that light is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light, no part of it will be dark. It will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. Jesus came and said, I am the light of the world. He said, you are the light of the world. His truth is that light. Apart from the truth, there's darkness. But not just darkness, there's like substitute lights. Lesser lights, worse lights, bad lights, evil lights. But they're shining their light, and it comes from within. Our prayer needs to be, God, fill us with light. <laughs> Teach us what it means to let that light out. Let it shine. So we could stop here, and it ends up being sort of abstract theology. I'm going to think, how could we apply that? What does that mean? Okay, am I light? Am I dark? Is my lamp? This is an awesome passage, and it's probably too long for us to read the whole thing, but I'm going to get through as much of it as we can, because it just lays out step by step by step what it looks like to live as children of the light. So would you turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll just read through it, talk through it, and let the Apostle Paul speak to us as well. We'll start at Ephesians 4, 17. Ephesians 4, 17. There's that statement, ignorance is bliss. It kind of applies to this too. Like you don't know what you don't know, and so you're fine. <laughs> and then you become aware of what you should know or something that you didn't know and you're now responsible for a lot more. Sometimes our faith can feel a little bit like this. God opens our eyes to something else. The way Ephesians handles that is it doesn't talk about trying to get more light. It doesn't talk about, you know, switching out our internal lights. It talks about what you're putting over the light, how we clothe ourselves. We are light. We are a lamp. But what do you put on top of that? Maybe you could put a shade. Still lets the light out into the room. That would be an appropriate covering for a light. Maybe something thin so that the light can still go out. But if you take a lamp and you put dark things over it, heavy things over it, black things over it, you defeat the entire purpose. Does it mean the lamp still isn't burning? The lamp's going strong. No one can see it. It's defeating its purpose. This is how our faith can be. We have this lamp inside of us, and it's just covered up. It's not achieving any purpose. Does it mean the lamp's out? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It's not doing what it's meant to do. So the darkness and the light and how we live and who we are on the inside, this is what this passage tackles. Let's just read it together. Ephesians 4, 17. Paul says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Don't be foolish in how you think. They're darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them. They don't get it, but why don't they get it? Because it's due to the hardening of their hearts. They don't want to get it. They walk away from the light. The closer the light gets, the more they retreat. And so, having stayed in darkness for so long, just like people who maybe work indoors or miners or something working black, your eyes don't adjust having lost all sensitivity to that light and hardened themselves against saying, no, I do not believe that. I will not listen to that truth. 
then they've given themselves over to every sensuality to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. You stay away from the light, stay away from truth. There is no truth. Just indulge yourself however you want. And after a while, it just seems right because everybody's doing it and you don't feel guilty conscience about it because you've given yourself over to it. You resist the fact that it may be sin because God defines it that way. And it's his truth. This, however, is not the way of life you learn. So church, we're learning a way of life from God's spirit as we study, whether it's a Sunday morning or a Bible study or at home opening the word. Just, we're learning this way of life. Doesn't mean we're not a lamp. Doesn't mean God hasn't lit us up from the inside. We're learning what it means to live this way, children of light. That is not the way of life that we learned. We don't hide from the truth when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted. You know, it gets worse. Sin gets worse. If you think we can sin once and be okay with it, not going to happen. Sin corrupts. Sin is like rust. It gets in there and then it just spreads. And eventually you've got to cut out a bunch and replace it. Sin corrupts. You were taught, take off that whole way of life. Throw it away. Throw away your whole way of thinking. Throw away your whole way of acting. Throw away all your preconceived ideas about what's right, what's wrong, because all of it was defined by you before. And who are you? Who am I? So throw that away. Take on this truth from Christ. 23. Verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of our minds, so to get a new way of thinking. And verse 24, to put on a new self, which is created to be like God. And this new self has true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must do this. Well, how do we do this? How do we become a lamp? Well, you have to put off falsehood. Do not lie to each other. Uh, what's another kind of falsehood? Don't flatter each other. Don't slander each other. Don't gossip about each other. What's falsehood? Um, don't cover up things. Don't pretend to be fine when you're not. Don't, don't be false. Be true. Say the truth. Say the truth in love. That's what we need to do because that's the light. So we can't be this way. So if you're lit from the inside, don't act this way. You're supposed to put that off. Speak truthfully to your neighbor for we are members of one body can't lie to your hand or your foot. It knows. It's together. You are one. In your anger, do not sin. Here's another example. What does it look like to live in the darkness versus in the light? Jesus was angry, but he didn't sin. You can be angry. It's okay. Christians aren't supposed to pretend that when they get mad that, like, Father, forgive me because I've sinned. No. Depends on what you're angry about. What are you angry about? Are you angry about something that God also would be angry about? Then you're fine. God's angry about lots of stuff. He's angry about sin. He's angry about hurt. He's angry about rejection. He's angry about these things. They make him angry. But he's fair in his response. He's just. He's not sinning. So be angry, but don't sin. Because that's this life, not the new one. That's not what a lamp does. A lamp gives off light, truth. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. So if you're angry, it's probably not going to go away probably going to fester. So if you just stuff it and let the sun go up, maybe go up and down for years and years and years and never address it, you're giving Satan an opportunity to say, you know, this thing that's been wrong for forever is still wrong. What's God doing about that? This person I was mad at all those years ago, still mad, never quite fixed. That's not a child of light. That's not what God wants. So get rid of this stuff. Sweep it out. Uncover the light. Another example, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. If we've been lazy, is another example, doing something for ourselves, if we've been stealing, taking from others, don't live that way. Let light shine. Don't deliberately do things that we know are going to hurt others or hurt God because we're called to love others and love God. So don't do these practices. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs and that it may benefit those who listen. Is that what comes out of our mouth? Things for encouraging people and building them up and so that everyone who's listening is encouraged in Christ and edified? Then if not, let's not do that. Let's recognize that that's not truth. That's not love. That's not what we're called to. These speech patterns may not be at all edifying to God. So does that mean that we're not godly? It means we're not God. It means he needs to continue to sanctify us. And in this metaphor, it means we're covering up the light. You're taking something that's been made so beautiful, 
Are you just dirtying it? No, let's not live that way. Let's be reminded. Let us remember. We've got light in us. Let the light shine out. Let it shine out. Don't stifle it. Don't darken it. Don't replace it with a different light. Let it be God's light and let it pour out through what we say, through what we do with our hands and how we work, for what we do when we're angry, for how we speak and the truth that we speak, all these things. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed. We've already been sealed. It's a promise. It's a brand. It's a tattoo. It's something permanent in our soul. It says, this guy, this girl, they're redeemed. Branded. Lit. The lamp. We're there. But we're not there. <laughs> We can do all sorts of things to contradict what's happened inside of us, and it just covers our light. Don't clothe ourselves with these things. Clothe ourselves, cover ourselves with things that help the light come out. Get rid of all bitterness. Are any of us bitter? Got to get rid of that. Got to cut it out. It is not, what's the right word? contradictory to the light within you. To be bitter after God has forgiven you, that's not God. That's the sludge left in us. That's us covering the light with something dark. Rage, if we have this anger that comes out at every moment, we don't know where it comes from, that's old self. Take that stuff off. Pray it off. Beg God to remove it. Remind yourself that we have been given the Spirit, call on the Spirit to bring out from within the peace. That's the opposite to the rage. All right, get rid of this rage, anger, brawling, slander. Do we have trouble not saying something about someone else? Call it gossip, call it slander. Do we have trouble with that? It's too easy for us to say this or that. It's not the way we're meant to be. That's not compatible with the light that's inside us. Get rid of every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as his dearly beloved children, and walk in the way, walk along the road of love. Go along that path. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. So this, our desires, our lusts, this shouldn't be something that we throw on top of our lamp. This is not something that's true. This is one of those corrupting things that doesn't just stay a little bad, but gets really bad. So what can God do in that area? Well, he's forgiven us for it. Can he change us? Can he light us up in that way? Will we accept it? Will we let him shine light into the dark, dirty parts? Because if we don't resist and we don't harden, he will. And it'll cause this intense conflict within us because we'll know there's something in us that the light is shining right on and it's not good. That's when we have the chance to submit to God and say, all right, you can, you can cut that out of me. I beg you to. I'm willing to let go of it. I'm willing not to put this over the lamp and I need your help for it. That's grace. That's salvation. We don't fix ourselves. We let God purify us. So no sexual immorality, no kind of impurity, no greed. These are inappropriate, improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity. These shouldn't be the sorts of ways that we talk. That's not what a light does. There shouldn't be foolish talk or coarse joking. They're out of place. It's like something that's in the wrong spot. You like parked your car in the living room. Some people under their influence have done that. Parked their car right in the living room. It's out of place. It does not belong there. It looks strange. It's, it's wrong. Not the way it was meant to be. Improper. So none of those things, so they're out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Why would thanksgiving be there? Because we've been given light. Someone saw fit to love us despite ourselves. Someone saw fit to forgive us despite ourselves. And it was this amazingly restorative and transformational experience for us. And it changed the way we look at the world. And that someone is Christ introduced to us to make that difference. That should shine out. Not, I've joined a new religion, and these are the things they've tell, told me to do. So I've got a lot of obligations now, and I, got, you know, I can't come and hang out on Sunday mornings anymore because I've got to go to church, and it's really hard to be good all the time. I really feel guilty because there's a lot of things I should be doing as a Christian that I know I'm not doing. It's not that sort of way. 
Thanksgiving should be natural because a light is bright. It's the nature of light. It's giving warmth, giving light. We've been forgiven. It should give us joy. That should be what comes out of our eyes. If our eyes are wide open and the lamp is shining, what's inside? Thanksgiving. We should be the most grateful people in the world. Most grateful people in the world. Definitely among the most privileged and most spoiled. We should be the most grateful. But it doesn't even matter the physical side of things. We're talking about Christ. Of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. If these aren't us, and deep down this is not us, and God has not given us this light, then we're not a part of the kingdom, because that's what the kingdom is. Now let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God wrath comes, come down, comes down on those who are disobedient. So our actions betray what is in us. Therefore do not partner with and here, this is the key verse of it all. You once were darkness. Not we lived in darkness. Not we had darkness. Not we couldn't see because of it. We were darkness. Inside us was darkness. So the lamps that we looked through, the eyes that we looked through, just saw whatever was in us. But now you are light in the Lord. It's a internal fundamental change so the light comes out just like the dark used to come out so live as children of light the fruit of the light that's an interesting metaphor fruit of light it consists in goodness righteousness and truth so ex exude the goodness exude truth look for the goodness can you see it do you see anything good in the world around you do you see anything good in yourself do you see anything good in the body of believers around you is there any good in the world do you have eyes to see goodness do you know goodness? Have you experienced it? So we're saying we can't see it unless we've experienced it, so it's pointing us inward. These are the things we're supposed to have experienced, thanksgiving and goodness and truth and light, and that's so that we have eyes to see it. We get that. You can't understand what it is to be married until you're married, but then you get it. You can't understand what it is to have children until you have children, then you get it. It just changes because there's some internal change that changes how you see the entire world. So what do we see when we look out at the world? We look and see everything's bad. Well, then is the lamp in us just a dark light? I'm bad. Life's bad. Well, that's not true. God made everything and called it good. And he said there'll be joy in his salvation. And he saved us for eternity. And there's hope for everyone from addicts to those on their deathbed at a ripe old age of a long, healthy life. So there's hope... <laughs> There's joy, there's forgiveness of our sins, there's peace, there's life and life more abundantly. These are good things. And if all we see when we look out is dark stuff, then that's saying something about our eyes. Our eyes are closed off within us, somehow not letting that light out. Maybe the light's not there. And if it isn't, ask God to put it there. But when it's there, if it's like so many of us, we just cover it up. We continue to grieve the Spirit. We continue to act in simple ways. We continue to push away the truth. We don't live like we're filled with light. Live like everybody else. And oh yeah, I've had a couple of really neat experiences with God along the way. That's not being a lamp. It's like being a piece of toast. You get burnt by the heat once, and you're like, look, I've got marks over here. You're not a lamp. You're not heat. You've had some exposure to it. We're supposed to emanate it. I want to close by saying this. Have you ever seen someone who has that twinkle in their eye? You just know that twinkle? Anybody here know Danny Lee? All right. Um, yeah, there he is. Wake up, Danny. Wake up. Um, anybody see my son Griffin? He's got that little twinkle. I don't know. Some people just have a twinkle in their eye. That's the light that's within them. And they just kind of exude it, and they're not trying to. It's somehow how they see the world. Now, my, my little son Griffin will say the silliest things because he sees the world as a silly sort of place. He's got eyes that see silliness. I want him to share with me what he sees because I don't see it that way. I see, the eye, see through my eyes, whatever my eyes paint. And when he brings his eyesight into my world and points something out or just giggles about something ridiculous, it brings cheer to me because he sees something I don't. He's got a light in him. We know people, Ellen, you can be this way. You come in with a big smile, give a big hug, bring a light of love to the place where you're at. A lot of us don't always feel that way. But then when we come into contact with you, you shed that light into us. We see it. It's like contagious. That's the way it's supposed to be. Just to pick a, I could pick hundreds of examples from all of you. It's supposed to be this visible thing. Don't let our eyes be stingy. We've got a light inside us, but we don't let it out, and we cover it with all these things that don't make any sense to put on top of a lamp. Let it 
out. Live with a twinkle in our eye. Live with that light in our eyes. When we come into a place, it's like God just came into this place through this person, and it's good. And when we look around, if all we see is the problems in the world and the, the problems with immigration or taxes or the things that are wrong and bad, and we, like, that's not all we should see. We should also be able to see, because of the light in us, it should illuminate the places where there's purity and where there's light and where things are good. And, you know, the innocence of a child that we want to protect and love and the importance of forgiveness. If we've never been forgiven, you're not going to spot forgiveness as an entity. You're not going to see when it's clearly evident that it's not there between two people and they're just at odds with each other. You're not going to notice that. But when you know what real forgiveness is, you're going to want that forgiveness for those people so much because now you have eyes to see. You just bought the forgiveness car and now you see everybody else just walking along the side of the road and their shoes are worn out. You're like, you've got to buy this car. This is so good. And you're going to look around and say, oh, look at all these other people. I can tell when they've experienced that same kind of forgiveness because it's something inside that like, pours out of us. So the challenge is really just asking ourselves, being self-aware enough to say, what do I notice? What don't I notice? That's saying something about my light. And or if not the light, what I'm covering over it. What do I bring? We should bring these things of the Spirit, the fruit of the light, they're in us. We're supposed to be shining this light outward. So from Jesus and the study that we're doing on him to us, this has nothing to do with a generational thing or ancient times and present times. This is just what it means to be a child of the light and to let that light shine forward. I'd like to ask the worship team to come forward and I'd like to ask everybody else just take a, a second just reflect on it. The Spirit will let us know. He'll shine that light into us. If there's something that's dark in us, just embrace that light and say, okay, I understand. If we don't, if things don't make sense, if our eyes still are not open, then just pray for that. God will do it. He is faithful. Amen.